everybody. Welcome back to the Compass Church and our series called David, the Life of a King. Can you believe we're in the last week of this series? This is week seven of our series and we got a good one to study together today. Today, I come to you from a building right across the street from our Wheaton campus on Roosevelt Road. Today, it's a dentist office, but though it's hard to tell, there's been a lot of renovations. This is the oldest house in Wheaton, no kidding. The original house was built back in 1847. That's 176 years ago. And it was built by a guy named Warren Wheaton. You guessed it, the guy this town was named after. But here's what's tricky. Warren was the first resident of this area, and you might assume it was named after him because of his pioneer frontiersman status, but that's not so. There was another reason they named the town after him. And to get into that reason, I need to tell you Warren's story. So Warren was born out east in a little town called Pomfret, where at the age of 20, he became a school teacher. He liked teaching, liked kids, but Warren was a dreamer, ambitious, and he had heard that in the new state of Illinois, the government was selling land, farmland, potential farmland, for a dollar and 25 cents an acre. And Warren decided, I'm gonna do it. The first year of teaching, he was able to save 160 bucks. In fact, for five years in a row, he saved 160 bucks each year, totaling $800. And at the age of 25, Warren set out for Illinois, kissed his mom and dad goodbye, and started this crazy journey. I mean, he hitched a ride on a stagecoach to Boston, and then a sailing ship to New York, and then a train to Buffalo, and then a steamship through the Great Lakes to Chicago, and then on foot he marched down, really, to call Roosevelt a road would be an exaggeration. It was a, it was a path, 30 miles west, until he came to this spot, saw the potential, used his $800 to buy 640 acres. He worked to tame the land, getting rid of rocks and brush and trees, but he got a working farm, he built the house, he met another pioneer young woman named Harriet, fell in love, married her, they had six kids, Warren was living the dream, the, the all-American dream in its purest form. And yet, he was empty. Warren couldn't figure out why his heart wasn't full, and he discussed the matter with his friend, his best friend, Erastus Gary. Erastus lived on the farm west of Wheaton's, and as it turns out, Erastus was a passionate lover of Jesus Christ. Erastus had been raised in a Wesleyan church and just adored the Lord and had a joy that, that Warren wanted. In fact, after much discussion and many questions answered, Warren Wheaton, as an adult, put his trust in Jesus Christ, fell in love with his maker, and found the meaning he had been seeking all along. And as a new believer... He shifted from a focus on success to a focus on significance. He wanted his life to count. And one of the ways he found he could do that was to tithe. You know, the Bible teaches about giving the first 10% to the Lord. And Warren started that. In fact, he and his buddy Erastus, they started a little house church, hired a pastor, and started giving to see the cause of God advance. When the church grew to where they needed their building, it was Warren Wheaton who said, I'll give some of my land for the church. I'll give some of my money to build a church. And the first church in Wheaton, a Wesleyan church, was built. Then uh, a guy by the name of Jonathan Blanchard, he had been a college president in Western Illinois. He came to this area, he met Warren Wheaton, and he cast a vision. Blanchard said, I want to start a college right here a Christian college that advances God's kingdom by building Christian leaders. And Warren Wheaton said, I'm in, how can I help? Warren Wheaton gave 50 acres of land and a lot of money. He was the number one donor to this brand new endeavor. 
In fact, Jonathan Blanchard was so impressed with the generosity of Warren Wheaton that he said, I'm gonna call the college Wheaton College. Can you believe that? In addition to that, Warren now was so caught up with this generosity that he had another idea. He took another 50 acres, had it divided up into streets and lots, and he gave away 250 residential lots. He announced anybody who wants to come and build a house, he knew that some of the pioneers didn't have enough resource. So he said, you build the house, I'll give you the land for free. Friends, it was this generosity that led to the people announcing, call the town Wheaton. The area had just been called Milton Township. And when they incorporated, the people cried out, we want it called Wheaton because of his generosity. Friends, you may say, yeah, it's easy for him to be generous. He was crazy wealthy. You should know something about Warren Wheaton. He intentionally lived a life of simplicity so that he could be generous. In fact, this building is quite big now, but back when he originally built it, the house he built was only 600 square feet. It was tiny. He lived in that little tiny house for 33 years. And then he put on a small addition, but he never left. This small home was his only home the entirety of his life. In fact, he died in this home after living here for over 60 years. So why did he choose such a simple life when others were maximizing their lifestyle? He did that so that he could make a difference for the cause of Christ and in the lives of people through generosity. At his funeral, one of his dear friends said, Warren Wheaton will forever be remembered as a man who willingly sacrificed both personal comfort and wealth in order to prosper others. Wow, the power of generosity. Friends, as we conclude our study of David, we're about to see that like Warren Wheaton, David loved being generous. One of King David's greatest dreams was to build a temple in Jerusalem for the Lord. You know, for centuries, God had been worshipped in a tent called the tabernacle. Well, David had a dream of turning that tent aside and making the most glorious temple the world had ever seen. And God said, no. It's so interesting. God said, David, you're a man with too much blood on your hands. And so I'm not going to let you build the temple. A little aside, you know, that's interesting. God's saying, sometimes I allow war, but God's like, let it be known. I don't celebrate war. And the fact that God said, David, no, you can't build the temple because of your involvement in war. That's an interesting communication of God's heart. But anyways, uh, the Lord said, David, it'll be your son, Solomon, who builds the temple after your death. Well, God did allow David to do two things concerning the temple. The one was the design. And so David poured over plans. In fact, in 1 Chronicles 28, you can read about David's involvement in the design of the temple. And then the second thing God said David could do was the fundraising. In 1 Chronicles 29, next chapter, you can read all about David coming to the people and saying, friends, this project is mammoth. And and we've got to raise a lot of money. In fact, it's the equivalent of a modern day NFL stadium dollar wise. You may know that stadiums today, they're spending multiple billion dollars. Well, when you do the math, we know what it costs. It'd be like a multi-billion dollar project. Maybe not in size, but the gold and silver and fine jewels that adorned this temple. It was going to be multi-billion in the modern equivalent of our money. And so David raises the money and the fundraising is a wild success. And right at the end of this tremendous success fundraising, David prays. You can find this and that's actually what we're going to study. It's in the second half of First Chronicles 29. That prayer of David is absolutely beautiful, absolutely profound. 
And I can't wait to study it with you because it illuminates for us so beautifully what giving is supposed to be like, this topic of generosity towards God's cause. It's a big part of David's life, and it should be a big part of ours as well. So let's dive in, shall we? The prayer uh, goes in this way. First Chronicles 29, verse 14. David says, who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Did you see his heart there? He's saying, ah, I'm so blessed. We're so lucky. We are so outrageously blessed to be able to participate in such an exciting endeavor like giving. You can tell that to David, he considers giving to be a privilege and an honor. <laughs> I have to chuckle because sometimes as a pastor, I observe that rather than celebrated, this aspect of following Jesus is, is sometimes hated. It's like the least favorite part of the Christian journey. They're like, oh, you can talk about anything. Don't talk about money. The minute you go there, you lost me. And I guess it's understandable. There have been a lot of churches and ministries that have abused the topic of money and used dishonoring schemes and brought an emphasis maybe that's too high. And so there's a lot of uh, bad feelings when it comes to giving. I just want to point out David had none. David said this giving of money and seeing it transformed into God advancing, God's kingdom advancing work. David's like, that's a privilege that I'm so excited to be at. Now, that begs the question, how is it that David sees giving in this way? And as we continue in the prayer, I'm going to point out six. I'm going to have to go quickly. But six ways David sees giving. And it helps us understand how God wants us to see giving and how we too can see it as a joy, a privilege. So what's the first? The first is this. Giving is stewardship. I know that that's a kind of churchy term in some ways, and I looked for an alternative, but no, we got to stick with the old-fashioned term. A steward is someone who manages the property of another. And the way David sees it, all his money is not his money. It's God's money, and he's merely the manager or the steward. Let me show you. Verse 14 continues. David prayed, everything we have comes from you, God, and we give only what you first gave us. And then let me jump ahead one verse to this summary statement of verse 16. David says, it all belongs to you. And so in some ways, David is saying, you know, giving is not really giving at all. It's simply giving back what God gave us and still owns. Uh, it has been said, everything we think we own is really on loan. And that's so true that those who have a Christian mindset do not view their possessions as their possessions. They view their whole lives as belonging to God. And therefore, when God, the owner, says to us, the steward, I, I ask that you give generously to my cause. And we ask, well, what's generous, Lord? And we find this 10%, the tithe. Some people are bothered by the 10% number. I'm so grateful that that is consistently used as a baseline for generosity because it lets me know if I'm doing well or not. How otherwise would we sense whether our generosity is, in fact, generous in God's eyes. He said 10%. When we give 10%, really what we're doing is we're saying, really, it's not just 10% that's yours, Lord. 100%, everything I've got is yours. You say the word, and you want 10% to go to your cause? Sure. It's your money. Yeah. It takes fighting to develop that perspective. And a lot of Christians say that they see it that way, but they really don't. Deep down, they're like, mine, mine, mine. But there is freedom in getting to a place where you say, you know what? I, I have nothing. It's all God's. It's, it's interesting. Ownership can rot the soul. 
ownership, clinging to what's yours is detrimental to the heart. And by coming to say, listen, I don't own anything. <laughs> I'm just a manager of all that's God's. There is actually soul health and freedom in that perspective. And so stewardship is how David sees it. I'll give you an example. The audacity of this. Can you imagine going to your bank and filling out a withdrawal slip and saying, yeah, uh, I need $1,000 in cash. And the cashier saying, oh, that's so cute that you asked for that. And Mr. Griffin, we aim to please, but I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to fulfill that request. And I'm like, what do you mean you're not going to fulfill the request? I got plenty of money in the bank. Give me $1,000 of my money. And the cashier is like, yeah, I understand, but I don't want to do that. I'd be ticked. I'd be saying, listen, buddy, it's not your money. It's my money. And if I tell you to give me some, give me some. That's how it is with God. And when the Lord says, listen, it's my money. You are mine. You were, if we're Christians, we, we were bought with a price. Christ died for our sins, granting us forgiveness. But now we belong to the Lord, all of who we are, all of what we have. All right. Without overdoing that point, let's move on. The second is this. Giving is investing in the future, in eternity. It's so interesting what David says in verse 15. He says, Lord, we are here, that is on this planet, for only a moment, visitors and strangers in the land, as our ancestors were before us. Our days on earth are like a passing shadow, gone so soon, without a trace. You know, David's expressing this perspective that life is short, eternity is long. He's expressing that perspective because it applies to the topic at hand, and that is giving. People who say, it's all about me, and they keep all the money for themselves, they convey that they don't understand that life is short and eternity is long. You know, they, they get to the end of their life and they die, and you've heard it said you can't take it with you. And they're kind of like, oh, my objective of collecting now seems foolish because I'm leaving it all behind. And yet those who give generously in this short life are actually investing money. You know, they're not losing the money. The Bible says that when we give to God's cause, that money is translated into eternal impact. Lives are changed through Christ forever. And when we get to heaven, we will be rewarded by God. We're not sure how, but he's going to reward us for our generosity here. So both in the reward and in the impact, when we give, it's translated into eternity. And so it's best to realize, listen, I'm only managing this money for a short window. Better be generous so that I see the winds on the other side. I once had a big gift card uh, for $200 to a restaurant. And I just felt like I was flying. I went to the restaurant one time. And I'm like, yeah, I should pay for it with this. And then they were like, ooh, you know. And I was like, just used a little bit of it. And I thought, this is going to be fun. The restaurant closed. I mean, like gone, shut down, went bankrupt. And now I'm looking at my gift card that still has like 170 bucks on it. And I'm like, no. And I come to the place, you know, just board it up. I'm like, what? it was worthless. It was gone. It was a reminder that uh, there was a window of opportunity to utilize that. And if the window passes, you're left holding a card that's worthless. Similarly, our money has a window when it can be translated into lasting impact. And if, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so keep that in mind, that giving is not losing. It's investing in what is eternal. Next. Giving is worship. David in his prayer in verse 16 says this, Lord, we have gathered this material, that's the construction material. We've gathered this material to build a temple to honor your holy name. What's the dream? A building, but beyond a building, that God would be exalted and praised, that his name would be made famous. So David's zeal for giving is wrapped up in bringing God worship 
in glory. And friends, that's how it should be for us. Ultimately, when we give, it's like, Lord, I love you. And I want to exalt you. And in the act of giving and what this giving will produce, I want to see your name lifted high. I want to see you celebrated. And those aren't just words, Lord. I put it into action through my giving. Giving is worship to God. So there are three. Let's go to four, shall we? The fourth one is giving is pleasing. And by that I mean pleasing to God. God is emotionally impacted by our giving. No kidding. David says in verse 17, David's praying and he says, Lord, I know that you examine our hearts and you rejoice when you find integrity there. Lord, you know that I have done all this, the giving, with good motives. David's reflecting on his motivation in giving. He's like, I'm not trying to impress people. I'm not trying to prove I'm something. I'm really, uh, David's thinking about it. I really think I'm giving with good motives, Lord, wanting you to be exalted and your kingdom advanced and wanting to obey as a good steward of your money. And David says, as I look at my heart, I think my heart is right. And I know that you're examining our hearts, wanting to know what's really there. And when you find uh, integrity, a purity of heart as expressed through generosity, David says, I know you rejoice in that, God. I know that thrills you. I don't know if you've thought about that, but we can impact God emotionally. That God can be pleased. Actually, the Bible says that often. God says to his people, I am pleased with you. Another way of saying that is I receive pleasure from your obedience. And friend, that's true with giving. That the Lord is like, yes, did you see that? They did it. Nice job. The Lord's getting excited and delighted when we show heroic devotion to him, obedience to him through generosity. It's pleasing. Let's go next. The next one, the fifth, is that giving is voluntary. Voluntary. Verse 17, uh, David, still praying, says, Lord, I have watched your people offer their gifts willingly. In other words, David's like, you know, I could have taken the leadership approach of twisting their arms, you know, manipulating them, guilting them. Come on, guys. And David's like, I didn't do that. I I was careful to make sure that the giving in this moment was voluntary, willing, out of their heart. And that's how God wants giving to be. Uh, Again, I've mentioned that sometimes churches abuse this topic and find ways to manipulate people into doing that which is inconsistent with their heart's desire. And and that's not what God wants. God wants it to be voluntary, willing. If, If you're being forced into it, it's not beautiful. For example, have you ever received a thank you note from the IRS saying, oh, we just received your taxes and we wanted to say thanks, such a kind donation. No. If they did, you'd say, listen, I didn't give it out of kindness. I didn't give it at all. You required it. That's the only reason I did it. You know? And if, if uh, giving to the church is like paying taxes, it's like, yeah, I got to do it. The beauty is lost. God wants it to be born out of our heart willingly with a voluntary uh, gesture where we say, listen, I love you, Lord. I love your cause. And you don't have to ask twice. You throw out the uh, invitation and I jump on it. That's the goal. And so take a look at your heart and just saying, am I feeling manipulated? Because if, if I'm begrudgingly giving, that's not God's goal. He wants it to be enthusiastic out of a willing heart. How about the last The last one is that giving is delightful, or at least I'll say it can be. It was to David and his people. Continuing verse 17, I I read this already, but I left off the last two words. We'll read them now. David says, I've watched your people offer their gifts willingly and joyfully. 
David's been watching this moment of generosity in the history of Israel, and he's like, these people are having a blast. They are finding so much joy in the privilege of giving. And that's how it's supposed to be. God says he loves a joyful giver. The objective is that we've moved far from hating this topic and that we've grown to the place where we love this aspect of the Christian life. Friends, I can tell you that I've gone through that journey. At first, I was like, ah, oh, I work hard for my money. Kind of want to spend it all on me. And I've, I've grown in my biblical understanding and my obedience in this area. And I can tell you that it's one of the areas of the Christian life I find the greatest joy. I just love it. Uh, it's an area of victory for me because God has said 10% is victory. A lot of areas in my life I wonder, am, am I doing well in there? I'm not sure. But that area I know. I am obeying the Lord and I feel his smile. And it's being, my obedience is being translated into eternal impact for God's cause. I, you know, just like with Warren Wheaton, where he was like, you know, I want my life to count. I really want it to be significant. What can I do? I don't want it to be all about me. I want it to be about my new Lord. You know, he was a new Christian. And Warren Wheaton turned to generosity and found great joy in this way to make a significant impact with his one life. So we can come to where this is what giving is. It's a blast. It was to David. It can be so to us as well. Hey, you know, sometimes I have people ask me, you know, the Compass Church has a lot of ministry going on. How is all that funded? It's a good question. And it's true. We have a lot of ministry going on. Do you, you know, we have five campuses, which have been reaching upwards of 4,000 people in person every week. That's thousands of lives being impacted on a weekly basis. Online, we have thousands of people connecting, many of you being a part of that. Uh, in addition to that, we have got uh, the Sheridan Prison. Uh, maybe the guys from Sheridan are watching this very talk. We have nearly 100 prisoners there who every week are joining us in worship through our video ministry. We've got a million dollars given every year to missions all over the world. Ministry is happening this week because of the generosity of people at the Compass Church. We've got uh, a quarter of a million dollars every year going out of our giving to assistance. You know, assistance is when we've got people in our church who are going through hard times financially. They're freaking out. Well, being a family means we're there for each other. And so we've got a team of staff and volunteers who oversee the distribution of, again, a quarter of a million a year to helping people in need. We've got ministries being funded to people struggling with addiction of various kinds. We've got a food pantry and a clothes pantry and a health center and ministries that we go to help in person, those who are hurting. So every week, so much ministry is going on. And you ask, well, how is it all funded? By Christians who get it. By Christians who understand that giving is no small part of the Christian life. It is central that God's cause has always been and will always be, be funded by people who live out the priority of Christ through giving. You know, our church is over 70 years old. And friends, all these decades, faithful ministry has rolled forward by lots of believers who understand what giving, what tithing means. He's like, well, they're all rich people. No, some of them are wealthy. Most of them are of modest means, but all of them are essential and all of them have been faithful. Would you be a part of that group who gets it and says, hey, this is an aspect of my life that's not been in line with God's will? Well, that's about to change. May you say, I want to get this right. Feel the smile of Jesus when you do. I love the passage. You may refer to it as the, uh, the widow's might. There was a moment when Jesus observed a widow 
old lady lost her husband, giving a, a couple coins. You know, actually, scholars have done some equivalent analysis and discovered that really it, those two coins, though they had been called pennies in the past, it's more an equivalent of two bucks. So if you want to imagine the widow's might moment, this is kind of what it looked like. You know, this woman coming up, reaching in and saying, all I got is two dollars. But I so believe in what God's doing. I want to give that. And when Jesus saw that, he called his disciples over. Guys, you got to say this. And Christ got so excited by the heroic obedience. Maybe they thought, ah, it was two bucks. Jesus knew. He's like, listen, that two bucks is beautiful if you know her situation and her heart. And Christ might add, when you add up the two bucks of all these people adding faithfully, it will be used by God in great ways. Christ found so much delight in that faithfulness. May he find delight in our faithfulness as well. Shall we pray towards that end? God, I thank you so much for your word. It is just so good. David has blessed us getting to know this king. His failure has taught us well, but even his victory, his generosity has seen in our study today. Let us be like David in those ways. Help us see giving as David saw giving, as you see giving. Give us your eyes and give us your delight in obeying you in these ways. And God, may the Compass Church be financially blessed in the days ahead, greater than it's ever been, so that our ministry advancing your fame and your cause would go forward like never before. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.